Okay, good morning class. Um, we still have a couple of minutes, so let me know if you have any questions with regard to lab three because uh, uh, today's tutorial, as, as we usually do, the second tutorial uh, is, is not related to the lab, it's more of an exercise and, and we program together to apply what we have learned in, uh, in lectures. So let me take a few questions about the lab if you have ones uh, before we do that. I guess as you all know, I, uh, I have already posted the midterm uh, grade zone avenue. E, yeah, every, okay, that's, that's a good question. In fact, um, I will update my announcement. It's, it's just very simple. Like the overall midterm grade is 90 grades. Every question is 30 grades, right? So I would say, or, or 30 marks. So I would, I would update my announcement that I just posted on avenue to include this as well, right? Um, so we had three questions, every, every one of them is uh, 30 marks and the overall midterm mark is, is 90. And to, to, to give a bit more of a, uh, more of a detail as well, uh, for those questions um, that you, you had to also write the test on the main, uh, the way this was done is the main, like the question itself, based on the question, it, it was either 20 or 25. Uh, and uh, the testing, so let's say 20, uh, because this was the most of, most of, the, you know, most of the cases, and uh, writing the test on main was either 10 or five, right? Um, so in the case, of, like the overall question was 20, part A, then part B testing in the main was 10. For, for the bug detection, you weren't asked to test this in the main. So the, all the 30 marks were in the bug detection itself. Most of the bug questions included five or six bugs. So you can simply say every bug is five or six, right? So this is how, how, how you can divide, uh, divide all the grades in detail. So Katie, please check my announcement. Uh, uh, so any discussion about the meet, I, I'm not sure if you have seen this, but it was just like a few minutes ago. So if you want to discuss the midterm grades, you are more than welcome to do this, but we are doing this only during the office hours next week, like my office hours, Tuesday after the lecture until three. Uh, and the thing to mention is um, given you have the solutions, I guess you might know what you have missed. And if, if, you, if you want to, to come and discuss the grade itself, I'm, I'm, again, I'm happy to do this, but you have to put into account that uh, I will be the one who is regrading your question. So you can either gain marks or lose ones and you should be open for both, right? So this is, uh, yeah, this, this is the rule. I guess Mark, you might be the one who had a GitHub issue and that's the reason you didn't receive the solutions. Um, so I would say if you want to talk to me after Let's talk after the tutorial because you, ha you are a special case. So let's, let's talk after the tutorial. Kurt, does our final course grades have to sort the IDs or does it mean the parameters pass will be sorted already? N no, I guess you have to sort stuff. And the, and the question is clear in the sense that, for example, what if you insert a new student then the list will be out of sort and you have to resort it. So you have to think of how to do that, right? This was a lab question. So uh, yeah, thanks, Kurt. Okay, is there any other question related to the lab? I, I hope that the midterm policy is very clear. You guys have all the solutions. And um, if you are not, like I, I'm, I'm pretty happy with, with the average of the grades. It's, it's really high, uh, but, but for some reason, if, you're, if, if your individual mark is you're not happy with, come talk to me and we will see, right? There might be a mistake that he is did most of the grading. So uh, I do also this kind of, uh, of, of discuss, discussing the, the grade next week, uh, also to make sure I guard that against any mistake that the TAs um, may have done, right? Um, so uh, yeah. For creating the list, do we assume the list is already sorted or do we have to sort it in our function? Um, let me think, let me open the document just to make sure. Um, let me open that. Lab three. 
Okay, so I'm going to share this one now. I hope you are able to see the lab document and let's see. Okay, here is the class list. You read from the file, the sort of patients are increasing order. Okay, so that means now the IDs in the file originally when you create the list, they should be already sorted in an increasing order, right? So you shouldn't be worrying the first time when you, um, when, when you, when you create the list for the very, very first time, you can just simply say it's, um, uh, it's, it's sorted. I finished the implementation for question two and it's still not running. Why is this? Yeah, so it's question, question three. So as, a, as I guess I have already said this in, 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 in during the lecture, uh, comment out the test cases for question three until you start doing this, Nicole. So I'm, I'm not sure then what is the problem if you have already commented these out. Um, one thing, because you are dealing with input output files, you want to make sure that the file is not open somewhere else. For example, you might be opening a file in your desk, writing into it, leaving it open, and then you allow the Eclipse to read it. But in this case, sometimes Eclipse will not be able to access a file that is already open with another application in the system. So make sure you have all the files you want in your program closed by all other applications uh, before you can run your program. Can I ask one more question? Sure, go ahead, please. Um, when you have to free the memory you created, such as for question one, like do you have to free the memory you created in question, um, no, sorry, not question one, like part A of yeah. question two? Yeah, so, so. And where do you free it? Because, <clears throat> sorry, <clears throat> where do you free it? Because you return you wouldn't do it in the create class list function, right? Correct, because otherwise you wouldn't be able to test it later, right? So it's better to be freed, you are correct. Generally, this would have been done in the main because once, just directly before you exit the main, you can free everything. So that's an excellent question. I, I really appreciate that because I uh, I believe this is not currently clear. So okay, good. So what? So here is here is my answer, right? This should be done in the test cases to see, right? Because test cases is replacing our main testing, which means by the end of the test question, you would assume all the calls of the functions are done and you have done your testing. So before exiting the test case, you can free all the memory you used during this test, right? Okay, so at the bottom of each test case, you free the memory. You free whatever memory, yeah, whatever memory you used. Yeah, okay. I, 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 yeah, I should announce this. Yeah, thanks, thanks, Nicole. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, um, for the last question, any malloc you have to free. This is a general rule, right? So any malloc you have done, you have to free. Good, uh, in question one or any question, because otherwise you would leave this in the memory. Um, for the lab three, question two, for the question, write a program to manage. Yeah, so about this writing program. Okay, so I, um, so just to know, I, I guess I told you this at the very beginning. This is the first time we deploy this test cases environment because I believe it's very useful and also very pragmatic. Like you, uh, the experience you guys gain from this is, is, is you will appreciate that later. So, so it's, it's, uh, it's a manageable way of doing testing. So, but this is not generally how the lab did run before. We didn't have this test case environment. So you will find some of the text may be not updated and it's my fault. I, I, ha I have updated most of it, but sometimes you've, you'll see these programs, like write a program, write a test program, ignore these, right? And I guess this was also the case for lab two, right? So when you, you see something in a question saying, write a program to test, you should know that you already write your test cases. We have at the very beginning of every lab, this clear, requirement that you need to write at least one test case for every function you write, right? So uh, this is replacing any writing of a main program. There is no issues with freeing malloc after return. A man, if this is related to Nicole point, then this depends on what you do. If you are returning from the function to another function, which is calling this one, then that's okay. I mean, 
think of this, the free and allocating is something you have control on. So you have to think on what is the right time to allocate and what is the right time to free. As far as you need the data inside this memory that you allocated, don't free it because you are going to use it later, right? To exemplify, for creating the test or sorting it or updating the grades or whatever during the test cases, you would need to use this information outside of your question two functions, right? You need to test, use them in your test cases to see. So the right thing is not to free them inside the question functions themselves. You would free them after you end your testing, right? So again, this depends on the use case. It's, there is no general rule. The advantage here that C is giving you is you have the control on when exactly to malloc and when exactly to free, right? So yes, it's, there is no issue freeing malloc after return of a certain function. As far as before you exit the program, you free everything. Uh, yes, I guess this is a yeah, vital question. How do we test question three if the test cases don't work? Look, the test cases do work vital. There is no problem with the code that I gave you, but you guys should, uh, I, again, so, okay. One thing I would advise everyone for you to do in to, to avoid I mean, I would say wondering about or, or, or feeling confused. If you, if you don't listen to the lecture recording, at least listen to the first five, 10 minutes because I do announce these things at the beginning of lectures and tutorials, right? So what I have said, I guess, twice in the last two lectures about guest question three test case is the following. There is nothing wrong about the starter code. The point is the code is initially empty. So you didn't implement your code yet. So if you run the program out of, like an empty program, your functions are not correctly implemented, then it wouldn't work, right? Generally, I mean, in lab one and lab two and some of, of the functions in lab three, they do work because the, you, you return a fault output and gives you a fault thing, right? By default. Then what you need to do is just comment this until you go ahead and implement question three. Once you implement question three, uncomment the test cases and then they would, short, they, they would work fine, right? Every single piece of code I give you guys, I test under many conditions myself, right? Not even the TAs. So I'm, I'm pretty sure there is no issue with that, right? Um, I hope this clarifies your, your concern. Ian, where do you create the student structure for lab three questions you within create list? Yeah, within the create list function. This is the purpose of the function, Ian, that's correct. Arjun, so if we free the memory at the end of the main, that's fine, or will this prevent this case from working? Uh, Arjun, I would say don't free this at the end of the main, free it with regard to the specific test case. For example, in question two, create list, you would be creating or you would be testing creating the list or averaging the function or uh, like calculating the final average. Every time you would assume everything is running from the beginning, right? So at the end of each test case, free all the memory you have used because each test case is standalone. Right? So it allocates the memory from the beginning because it calls the functions. And then at the end, you should free it. How do we test question two with draw and destroy functions? I'm not really too comfortable with changing stuff in test cases. First of all, you are, you would like, I'm not sure what you mean by AK by comfortable changing test cases because you have to add your own test cases. And this is what you have been doing in lab zero, lab one, lab, lab two. And how to test with draw, then simply you create a list you withdraw a certain student, which is like, if you go to the withdraw function here, this explains to you how the function should work. And then at the end, you would, you would be testing whether this student is there or not. For example, by calculating the, the final grade, right? Doesn't return terminal the function. So it doesn't run the code. Yan Hao, return terminates the function. That's correct, but it doesn't run the code that frees the memory. I mean, yes, it doesn't free for you, so you have to do the free yourself. Oh, Nicole, that's not the case. You, you cannot just pass free without passing a certain point, right? So you have to pass, um, you have to pass a certain pointer so let me see, for, for yours, let me look into question one. I guess this is related to question one. Like that's just the test case you gave us. No, I, I know you need an argument. I just don't. Ah, uh, yeah, yeah. So, okay, so good. So in, 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 in this case, I would say for question one, that's okay because it's a single, a single string, 
right? So if you do, and, and this is, but this doesn't even have a malloc here, right? Or you do a malloc inside. Oh yeah, it asks you to do the malloc and, and calloc inside, right? Uh, let me think. And what we are returning is the pointer to the first element of this allocated memory. Is that correct? The function creates a new string by calling it. The function has to call malloc for the new string, for the total number of characters. Okay, the, the function returns the new string, the value of the pointer, the first array, in other words, the address of the first array. You are not allowed to call the function declared in the standard. Okay, so in this case, if you want, so first of all, if you, for a question one, especially if you don't want to, to free here, that's okay, right? Don't, don't, don't bother about question one because it's just a single array, so it's no big deal. But to be consistent and correct across all cases, what I can do for question one here is simply the following, not print immediately. It's like, don't call my star cat inside the CU assert itself. What I would do is I would take the output of my star cat into a pointer, and this would be the pointer that you can free, right? Yeah, I think we can answer your question before about editing the test cases. There's yeah, just yeah, correct. So I would say if you don't want to do this, why I said, if you don't want this in question one, don't do it, right? Okay. Yeah. Um, Frank, please read the beginning of, of, of the lab document and it tells you like you need at least one test case per every function or if you want to combine. So simply you have to test everything. So the general rule is every function you implement, you have to have a test case for that. And do we need to create our new files? Yes, you can, you can create whatever file you want. Uh, as, a, as an example, like three, four lines are okay, right? If you look into the example files I gave you, uh, they are, um, they have like, I guess, five, six students, right? It's something that you can easily create randomly um, in, an, in an increasing order. Mark, is there a way to read a string from a file into the read only memory? I'm just wondering how we can read a string into memory without knowing its length beforehand. So Mark, with regard to this, uh, I guess if you are referring to the name, like first name and last name, which are the two strings in the student structure, you can assume, and I have, I guess I have also answered this. Oh no, so I have answered this, someone asking me through email and, and TAs have been answering this already in office hours. You, you don't have to, you don't have to, um, you don't have to assume this is something that is, that is random. You, you can just, or, or, or like uh, is unbounded. You can simply define your string or character of arrays for the first name and last name to have something reasonable. I don't know, like what, what would be the maximum of a first name student? Like 20 characters, I would say like 100 characters, that's, that's also okay. So this can be fixed, that's okay. You don't have to dynamically allocate that. So just to make it clear, like the names of the students, first name and last name can be assumed to be just normal character arrays with a maximum size, right? Good. Okay, is there any question related to the lab? For question three, it would also be the same thing. I know, give me a, a second. For question three is the word. So let me see if you are given any constraint on the words. Okay, so this end pointer gives you the number of words in the file. What is the length of the word? I guess this is what you are referring to. Oh, I, 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 went, I went glitchy for a couple of seconds. So I, I didn't say anything um, that, that's okay. I, I guess I'm back now. Don't allocate more memory than necessary for the array strings or for the individual words. The input file contain positive. Yeah, so, so simply this applies what we have done in, um, we, what we have done in, in, in the lecture. So, so to be honest, this bonus question is, di is a direct application of what we have done as a 2D array, uh, dynamically allocating 2D array in memory. So if, even if you open the lecture, you'd find a straightforward example that you can easily modify, right? So I, 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 I would refer anyone asking about this to go back to, to, this, to this 2D memory allocation. Uh, I guess also we have done an example for, for strings. Right? So it's even more related to the question itself, right? Um, Okay. Is, is there any question related 
related to the lab before we, we, we go through certain exercises. Feel free to ask whatever, whatever you want. I mean, the original purpose of the tutorial is to service the lab, right? So these exercises I just do for sake of leveraging the time because the lab takes two weeks. So if you have more questions about the lab, I'm, I'm, I'm fine, right? There is a bonus question. We already get 70 from the first two where we'll get the extra point. Yeah, so that's also a good question, Ahmed. So usually the bonus question in the lab applies to your overall grade. So for example, if you get 70 out of 70 in the lab and you also do the bonus question, this carries forward to your overall grade, right? So if you lose something in the midterm or the final or other labs, this can be um, something that fills these, these gaps, right? Or lost grades. So it's a 1% on our total grade? Yeah, it's 1% of the total grade. Yeah, that's correct. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Is there any other question? Good. Okay. So let me now shift to um, shift to the couple of questions I wanted to discuss with you as an application to the recursion and bit, bitwise manipulation. The last two things we discussed in C uh, before we uh, we start discussing Java in today's lecture. Let's go full screen. Okay, assume I want, and, and this is a question that we have done during lectures and also some of you got uh, a related question in the midterm exam. So I want, assume I want to, re, as, forget about recursion for now. Assume I want to reverse a string, right? Uh, that I take as an input, like the, the pointer to the first character. How I would do it? What we have done, can someone remind me what we have done during lectures or how, how you would approach this without recursion? What you would do? for loop count back, Nicole. Yeah, that's, that's, that's correct. You, you have, first of all, you need to come up with the size of the string, right? So you start by a loop that goes until the end, until you hit the null character. And now you would simply just start printing backward. Like you start the last character and then you, 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 uh, sub, you, you uh, decrement your pointer and then the one before the last, et cetera, et cetera, until you reach the one. So you have a loop at the beginning that goes from the beginning to the end of the string you stop at the end by the pointer and then you start going back, right? This is how you would do it, which means you would have to do it like for, for two, four loops, right? Now let's think how I can do this recursively, right? Um, can, can someone, I know it, it might be a little bit complex because you might not have the recursion uh, mindset right now, but how to do it uh, using recursion? Can, can someone give any idea? Yeah, you're correct here on how we should find this. So, so if I want to do this recursively, how I would do it? So assume, let's, let me give you an example just to help visualize the stuff. Assume I have something like MacMaster. No, at the end for sure I have the null character. Then I want to, simply reverse this, print this in the reverse order. Would you base case only one character in string? That's a good start, Katie. Thinking about the base case. Remember what we said in the lecture, you should start thinking in two things. What is your base case and what is your recursion step? So you are correct in the, in the base case, which is if you have a string of only one character, reversing it is just returning the character itself. Perfect, thank you so much, Katie. And then Sarah, for every letter, print the letter after it first. Um, well, but this is what I would do without recursion as well, right? So it's just the loop. So let's, let's start from the base case and let's think how I can get the step, right? If I have a single character, then simply return the character. What, I have, what if I have two? What I would do? I would have to simply split it into two bring the second one first and then bring the first one, right? Right? So this is, this is how it should work, right? Then subtract character, the last index, then subtract one. So, so yeah, the, the, base, the base idea is how I would, maybe I should ask the question in a different way or, or when you think you should ask your, your, this question in a certain way, which is now this is your base case. And this is your start point, which is the first string. 
how you would go there. You need to reduce your full string into the single character, right? The way to do this is to start splitting your string, right? So simply you should start splitting stuff. And then by doing this, recursively calling your uh, reverse string each time on your splitted one. And then it's going to split it again, 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 until you reach to the only a single character, right? Does this make sense? So now for jumping into the solution, for example here, I would keep splitting this and call the recursive on that, for example. And then for this one to reverse, I would have to simply split it as well and then split it back again. And then once I find myself, this is a single character, I would print it. And then this is what I would return to the function that called me. And then now I'll go back here. I'll find myself got me a single character and one is remaining, so I will just do this. And this two are returned to the one that had the four. While on the same time, this is the one that I called in these two as well. It gives me T first and then S, then combine these together. So let me visualize it in a better way because that seems messy. Assume that I have these two four characters right now, right? I am splitting them into two. And then I'm splitting every two into one. And then this is a one, so I put it first and this is the E. This is working in isolation. In the same time, I can also do a recursive call on this, bring the T first and then the S, right? Now I'm calling also recursive on these to give me E, sorry, this should be R, E, and then T, S. I'm doing the same thing here in the recursion call, gives me here this half of the string already um, reverse it. And then now I should recursive recall in these two to put this one first before this one. So you see how I keep calling the recursive split string on e, not split, the, the, I split string and then recursively call the reverse string in each of the one that I split it, right? And then I combine this alone, this alone, and then I combine them by reversing them. And then this gives me another half, add this to the other one that was working in parallel, for example, right? So let's, let's think how this, but first of all, before looking into the code, does this make sense? Because the, the mindset is really what is important, right? Is there any question related to this? Okay, so I guess by looking into the code, you might, you might, you might have more questions or, or, or get this. So what I would do, again, I would have a base case and I would have the step. Correct? The base case is a single character as Katie said, but I know that the last one is a null character for a string. So I'm saying my base case, if you have a null character, I'm just printing like the, um, I'm done. I'm just returning. I'm, I'm done. like here, I'm, I'm not printing anything, right? While uh, if I'm not in the null character, which is the last character, what I would do, I would simply call the reverse string in the S plus one. This is in fact a different, like I would say, it, it might be doing it differently than what I explained here. So let me do another thing here. I can do another recursive way, which is, I guess the solution is resembling. And instead of splitting it into halves and then reverse and then keep reversing, what the solution that I showed, I showed you is, is doing is saying, this is the full string. And instead of taking it fully, I'm going to just take it minus one, right? So just have, do the, recur the, the recursion on only the, the full string minus one, and then do another recursion in the full string minus one, and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. If I keep, if like, if you, if you keep doing this, you will end up reaching the null character. If you reach the null character, this is your base case. Otherwise you would keep calling the reverse string, right? So this is, this is what it's doing. It's saying, if you are not reaching the null character, call the string reverse, but now increase the size by one, right? And then you would just simply brand whatever character you are in right now. So if we trace this, let's, let's take an example. The MacMaster one, we have, uh, we have discussed, right? And let's see how we apply this, how we trace it to, to make sure we understand it. At the beginning, I'm passing this, uh, this, this pointer here at the beginning of the string. Am I in the null character? No. So what I should do is simply, I'm not 
hitting this F, I'm, I'm in the else right now. I didn't reach my base case yet. So what I would do is I would subtract one from my string by increasing the pointer by one, right? So I, I shift my S here into one. This is the S plus one statement here, right? So you, you shift here. Did you hit the null character? Not yet. So keep calling your string reverse, right? So if I reach here, the R1, R and then N, I would be calling, did you hit the null character? Not yet because I am in the R right now. So what you would do is you would call this the, the next last time, which is uh, the base case. So you print, this should be zero. I, I always do this mistake. So uh, you would be printing your, you, you'd be simply just not printing anything because you hit the null character, you just return, right? And then by returning, now you would be assembly operating on the R, right? Then you would be printing the R, right? And then you start going back in your, in your calls. Remember what we discussed in the stack? This was the last call of the string reverse. Now you start rolling back, right? You, you print R and then you print the E and then you print the T and then the S and then the A and then the M and then the C and then the, the M back again, right? This is how you just, you will keep doing in this step case until you, uh, you, you, hit, you, you hit your last string. Does this make sense? Any question? So it's simply, you can think of this like we have done the loop, but just doing the string reverse until I hit the, like the null character. So in, in a way, this is no different than just doing a loop until you hit the null character. Again, here, I'm doing a loop in the recursion until I hit the null character, and then I start printing from back to end. So this emphasizes what we have said in the lecture that recursion is really not providing a different solution. It's just, or, or maybe a unique solution that wouldn't be existing without recursion. It's just a different way of looking into the problem, right? I don't understand how it jumps from the last two into the second last two. Yeah, so, so okay, so let's say I was in the R, right? So what I would do in the R is, is the following. I'm, I'm in, in the string reverse S plus one, so I keep calling that, right? Until I hit my, my null character. If I hit my null character, I just return, right? Then afterwards, what I'm, I would be doing, I would be rolling back to the R case, which is the one that called me, right? And then in this case, if you roll back, you have this one additional statement, because remember we said, if you come back from a function call, you would be jumping to the, like you have already finished the function call, you go to the next statement. Here, this next statement is printing the character itself. So if I give you the example of only R and this null character, once you come back with the, from the null character, you would be coming back here, then you would be printing the character you are in, which is S, right? Uh, like the S itself, which is R here, right? So you'd be printing R and then, once you hit here, you would return, right? Because you finished this function call, you go back to the function that called you. But if you were in the R, what is the function that called you? It was the string reverse, but it was in E, right? So you come back, you will find yourself you are in E and you would print E, right? So this print statement is the one that is being revert, like it has, it, it's being done in the opposite order, right? So if we just have A, B, C as a simple example, and forget about the null character for now. So it, you would be printing C first, and then coming back from the function that called C is the function that was originally in B, right? So it would be printing B, and then coming back from the function that called B, it would be the function that was, had the pointer originally in A, so it would print A, right? Is, is that clear? So because the, um, it calls the function itself before the print, the print doesn't occur until the base case is met, which completes the loop of- Exactly. The, the until function reaching itself. the null character, okay. correct. Yeah, correct. Right, so is that true for any recursive function then? If you do any operations after the recursive call, those operations only complete once the base case is reached? Correct, because each time you had this call, you go inside it and you hit another call. So you keep calling everything until you hit the base case. So you are correct. So the general rule is the following. 
if you have any, not necessarily a printf, if you have any logic code or statements or lines of code after the recursion call, those ones get uh, executed generally after you had the base case and they get executed in the opposite order because you come back from the base to the last one before the base and then you, you do execute all these pieces of code. In this case here, it's the printf, right? So yes, they get only executed after you hit the base and they get executed in the reverse order from the base until the, like the very first call of the function, right? Okay, thank you. Yeah, welcome, thanks. So Katie, I guess your question was about this other solution, right? So in this case, it's, it, it would be a little bit, it wouldn't like this, this solution wouldn't apply. This, this would require different piece of code because here we don't split. So I guess what confused you is this split half thing is really not implemented here, right? So what I would say is maybe take this as an exercise for this question. I, I will be posting the solutions for, for this example here, right? So those solutions in the slides will be posted. But one thing can be done, there is no one correct solution. There are multiple versions, right? So the second version that I'm proposing here is you would be splitting this into halves. But really to be able to split into half, you would need to know the size, right? So it's a, a little bit less efficient. So this is a less efficient solution because you cannot split into half until you know your size. And if I know my size, I can just simply print it in the reverse order, right? So, but, but we will see now how splitting into halves would, would be beneficial in other cases where you know the length. Jack, can we write out the code for the first theory, the one where you split because I don't follow it. Correction, I just heard you say, yeah, so, so, so Jack, what I was saying is no, I'm, I'm not going to post this solution for the split. I'm going to post the solution for this case, which is the one that we discussed. I would leave you to think about this, but what I'm saying is that this is a less efficient solution because to split into half, you need to know the size first, right? So, and if you know the size, that means you had the end of the string. So maybe this solution that we discussed is more efficient then. So I would say ignore about this for now. We will come into this in a normal array where you already know the size, right? Okay, that's a good question, Nicole. So, so, no, it doesn't have the ER in fact, it has only the E because what you see here is we are printing a character, right? Not a string, which means I'm printing only the character that the pointer is pointing to. And that's an excellent point because if you had this as an S, you would get the wrong result, right? So if you think of the mentality of the, of the bugging question, of the bug question I give you in the, in the exam, one bug I would think of is what if I had this as an S and it's a very, very implicit bug, right? If I had this as an S, what you said, Nicole, would, would happen, right? But this is a character, so it only brings the character that the pointer is pointing to, not the next one until you hit, you hit the null. Right? Okay, good. Okay, so, so symmetric array, this is something that also would require splitting things into halves. And this is usually called binary solutions and, and I will, um, so here, this, this, this really wasn't the, the correct use case of splitting into halves because in a string, you don't know the size, but it, like in the symmetric array, it would. So let's, let's first define what is a symmetric array. A symmetric array is simply an array that if you print all the elements from the beginning to the end and from the end to the beginning, they would be exactly the same thing. Like for example, if you look into this one, this one is symmetric because if you look from, for the array from here to here or from here to here, it's exactly the same sequence, right? While uh, if you look into this such array, for example, this is not symmetric because the sequence is not uh, symmetric from, from both sides. Why symmetric arrays is like an interesting case? Because also I want you to, yes, this, was, this is for educational purpose, but also these, some of these problems really have very important um, applications in the real world. Symmetry is a very important topic in security, for example, right? If you have a symmetric key, it's, it has very different characteristics than having an as, uh, asymmetric key. Why? Because if you have, for example, a symmetric key, it might be very easy to, in, to include and decode, but the trade off here, it also might be easy to reverse engineer. On the other hand, if you have asymmetric code, it's more cost to include and decode this, while on the other hand, it's harder to reverse engineer, right? So for example, symmetry in, 
in, in, in security is, is one hot topic, right? Like one topic that has many applications there. So this is why, for example, what might be symmetric arrays or generally symmetric data structures are, are important to discuss. What we want to do in this, in, this, in this function is simply take an array and then simply take what is the first, so low initially is element zero, high is element n minus one, like the large, like the, the last element. And you want to determine whether this is symmetric or not. If it's symmetric, you return one, so return one. Uh, and if, you, uh, if, if it's not symmetric, you return zero. So this is simply what, you, what we want to do. Again, let's think of how to do this if we don't use recursion. So what you would do, if, if you don't use recursion, what you would do? Any idea? Yes, got them. That's correct. Loop, but but well, what to do in a loop? I mean, any array problem would be solved with a loop, but how to do it, right? That's the trick. We had a very similar problem, in fact, in in when we discussed the array uh, uh, questions. Nested for loop starting at the opposite ends and comparing. Well, if you have it nested, then you only have one going on. No nested for, yeah, no need for it. So simply, maybe you can have two for loops. The, the, the first and maybe the most uh, uh, naive or the easiest solution is say the following. I've, I will first reverse the array, right? Through a for loop. And then compare, have another loop that compares the reversed array with the, with the one, one by one. That's a correct solution from the functionality point of view, right? But why this solution might not be effective. So for example, I have four, two for loops. The first one here, so this is non recursive, but naive. I have two for loops. The first four is simply reverse the array and place it in another array, array two, good. The second for loop is to compare array two with the original array, right? If they match, if, if any two indices don't match, then you return zero directly. And if you hit the end of the loop without returning at all, then you return one, which means it's symmetric. What is the problem with this solution? Zao cut to half, excellent. That's, that's, that would be the, the next step to discuss, which what we discussed during lectures. So what would be the problem with this solution? The first problem is we are using two full loops. So it, it takes time. So if you have a, an array of size N, you need to go through N twice. The second problem is you are defining a new array equal to the size of this. You take double the size of the memory, right? So you have two problems from the space point of view or memory point of view and from the running time point of view. Then. The second non-recursive, but not naive solution is as, as uh, let me see the name just to give the credit, as Zaubu was saying in the chat is maybe you need to either cut to half or do what we have done in the lecture, have an index from the beginning an index to the end because you, the function takes low and high, right? So you already have this information. So you know what is the beginning of the array and what is the end of the array. If I know this here, this is my array. I have, this is low, this is high. What I can do is simply compare low and high. If they match perfect, I advance low to be here. I decrease or decrement high to be here and compare these two and keep doing that, right? And we, have an, we had an example in, 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 in the lecture to do this kind of trick. When to stop? What do you think? When to stop? The middle, correct. And how to determine the middle? Low is larger than or equal to high. Perfect mark. Thank you. Thanks. And, and yeah, middle minus one for the odds as well. So once the low exceeds the high, then you know that you have already covered the whole array and then you stop. Perfect. So this is the non-recursive solution. So what about the recursive one? So let's now discuss if I want to do this recursively, what to do? Okay. 
first of all, the base case. What is the base case? Any problem that comes to your mind recursively, you think of the base case. What is the base case? Any idea? A base case is the one that doesn't require any other call, right? There is only one number, perfect and how that's correct. Uh, which means, Karina, also this can be another base case, but now we do an extra check. So both are correct, in fact. So if you have a single element, you just return this element because a single element would require no calculation at all. Or if you have, you can say that a base case is where I have an array of two elements. And then in this case, I can simply check these without another call. So both are correct, right? So now you can have two base cases, right? And then let's, let's look into the code and discuss, discuss about this. In this case, we say our base case is simply, and, and I guess also others were saying this in the chat, our base case, if the low is larger than the high, which means I have reached it to the case where you have a single element. If you are, uh, if you are odd, or you reach it to two elements, you are if you are even, right? So, let's say I have four elements. Your base case, if you have four elements, will never be a single element in this case, right? Because you every time you would have two elements to compare, right? So in this case, your base case would be you would be comparing two elements. And this would be your low, and this would be your high. And afterwards, once you go back, the low will be larger than or equal to the high. In this case, it will be larger than the, the high, right? If you have an odd scenario, let's say five elements in a state, in this case, your base case would be that the low and high reach it here, right? So low is equal to high. While in this case, once the low exceeds the high, then you know that you have already done your array. So this is taking, there can be multiple solutions to this problem as, as we all know, but the point is in this solution, we are taking both the odd and even into account to say, if the low is larger than or equal to the high, so you, you account for both the odd and the even, you just return one, which means, okay, I have done all the comparisons. I just return one, which means this part is symmetric, right? While this is my base case, while in the, now the second thing to think, or the sec second question to ask is what would be my step? I have the big array. I have only the case where I have a single element or two elements. How to reach there, right? So how to, re how to reduce, what is the reduction? Using the low and high, what, what to do, what do you think? All, or, your, or what you say here guys is correct, I guess, as I was explained. For some reason, there is, there is a lag. You, there, there, your solutions comes a little bit later than my discussion, but it might be a problem in my end. So you don't feel that there is a lag at all, right? For your side, right? You hear me pretty fine, I would guess. Yes. Okay, thanks. Okay, so, so let's think of the, of, the, of the reduction. So I have the big array. I have the base case, which is a single element in case of uh, odd or two elements in case of even. Then how to reach there? Now I have, I have this low and high indices that originally they are very far, beginning, end. Base case, they are either equal or flipped. How to reach from here to here? What do you think? Ah, oh, yeah, maybe writing is, is the case, that's correct. So, so, so what to do in, in the reduction case? Because that's the most important two things to think about, base case and reduction or step, right? So simply my, my, any idea before we go? Like, can someone propose what would, how I would reduce my original case into the base case? Okay, so what, what we would do is simply, I want to advance the high and low, right? To, to move them such that they can meet at a certain point and reach the base case, right? So the operation would be in, in the high and low. So here in our reduction or step, I would say as far as the low is less than the high, which means I never issued my base case, what I can do is I would check if these two elements are equal, then I would be calling the function recursively on the remaining parts, right? So what I would do is I would be calling symmetric by advancing the low and the high. Otherwise, if these two elements are not equal, 
that means I just broke the symmetry and I return zero. So again, to, to, to make sure we understand, let's take an example. Let's take an example of a symmetric array. One, two, three, four, five, something like one, one, three, three, and then four, for example, right? Initially, low is here and high is here. This is high, this is low. At the beginning, low is less than high, that's correct. Then I'm doing the comparison, which means I'm reducing the comparison to only these two elements, right? Are these equivalent? Yes, they equal to each other. Now, I would have to care about the remaining ones. And this is a reduction. As if you reduce your array size for the symmetry for only the ones that you didn't compare yet. And these are the ones I am passing here to the other function. You can, this is low plus one. And this is high minus one, right? Which means in the second call, so maybe this, this is time to go through all the steps for you to, to make sure you get it. So initially we had th one, three, four, three, one. First call. Second call, what we would have? Can someone tell us what we would have in the second call? Yep. So ignore the, the elements you compared and you would have three, four, three. Third call, you would have four. This third call is a single number, so it's your base case, because low now is equal to high, you just return. You return from this one, now you would reach, every time you would return, you would just be returning here, so you would never reach the else, and then you just return one. So every function would be returning one, return one, return one, while you reach the last call, which is returning one. That means it's symmetric. Let's take an example where it's not symmetric. So in this case, Maybe I would just write directly into this. Let's say I would have, this is as five. And in this case, this would be five. So first call is the same because one compared with one, perfect. So I would be doing the second call. In this case, this is five, four, three. If I come to the second call with five, four, three, I would check if the low equal to the high. Now I'm comparing this with this. No, they are not equal. I'm just returning zero. Do it. If you return zero, you no longer continue because really it doesn't matter. Even if every number afterwards is symmetric, you broke the condition. So you return zero. This re the zero return would come into, like it, it will propagate and at the end the function will be returning zero. Do it. Is there any question here? Because in the in, in, in the last, I know that the time of, is over, but I wanted to discuss with you also a problem related to pitwise operations. So we might take extra few minutes if 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 you are okay. But let me know first if you have questions. Can we do over how the middle number is printed if the string is even? Yeah, this this also might be a good point. Let's say I have that. One five four. I would say, oh, let's say it's not five. I keep it symmetric. Three, four, four, three, one, right? So this is, this is an even uh, array and it's symmetric array, right? So let's see, at the beginning, one and one, first call. So it's, I have the full array and it's symmetric. So I compare these, good. Second call is three, four, four, three, compare these and then four, four. You reach here four, four, you'll find that your low is here, your high is here. Still, the low is less than the high, so you would do also the comparison. The comparison is true, so you would do another call, but by advancing the low and the high. So this is the, uh, this is second call, this is third call. In the fourth call, you would be calling the low and the high as if this is four, this is four, but this is your high now, and this is your low. You would find in this last call, which is the fourth one, your low is larger than the high, so you just return one, because it means you flipped, right? So fourth call is returning one all the time, and then you go back and it keeps returning one. So this is what I meant by saying that the base case, by having this inequality, like larger than or equal, is taking into account both the odd and the even case, right? You would have, you can also write um, 
the ought is the one that we were discussing, Danny, right? So, um, so the one that we were discussing is really the ought because you have five elements, right? So, so you can write this program using a different solution. Like for example, say I'm going to handle the even and the odd differently. Yeah, well, that's, that's possible. Uh, and it would be correct as well, no, no problem. It would be, might be more good, but that's fine, right? Okay, so I would just take a last question with regard to the bitwise manipulation, and then we will uh, hopefully this just takes a few minutes, right? So Hamming distance, what is Hamming distance? I know that all of you didn't take any communications course before because this is a kind of maybe third, fourth year, but simply to, to explain to you is uh, if you have a code, so let's say I have a binary representation of a certain number, right? And then I have another number, like two different numbers. There is something in communications called Hamming distance, which compares the two numbers together. How will you compare? You simply take the bits of this number and the bits of this number, compare them bit by bit. So in, in our example here, we have one, one, zero, zero, one, one, zero, zero. And then we have one, zero, one, zero, one, zero, one, zero. You compare them bit by bit. If they match, then you don't count. I will tell you now what, what we mean by count. But simply you maintain a counter that counts where the bits are different. Here, that's one, two, three, four. So we have four different bits, right? So this is called a distance of four. Why do we care? Because the distance between two different codes tells you how these codes are different. And this is a way to determine, for example, error correction. If, if, because your, your all, all calls right now are done uh, over the air, they encounter buildings, they encounter interference from cars from everywhere. They might reach the one that you are calling differently. There are, there are some errors and the channel has to accommodate for this error correction. If they are different in a single bit, then this can be corrected. But if they are different in 10 bits, for example, everything is messed up, right? So determining how two bits or how two numbers are far from each other is an important application in communications. Um, and this is done by counting how many bits are different. So again, this is the application. If, if you don't fully get it, don't worry. The base question is the following. Take two binary numbers, count how many bits are different, and this is your distance, right? So you are, you are required to function, write a function of this prototype where it, it simply returns an int, which is the, the distance, which is four here. It takes into account two numbers, and again, like counts the difference. So how to do this? Simply, I, I mean, this is a straightforward application of bit manipulation, right? Yeah, the, the slides will be posted and hopefully by today. So how, how to do that? Um, what I would, maybe I will jump, jump directly to the solution because there is no time, but, but simply remember from the last lecture, we said the gate, the logic operation that tells you where bits are different is the XOR operation, right? XOR is the function that gives you one if the bits are different. So simply what you would need to do is to XOR all the bits of this variable and count the ones of the resulting number, right? How to count the ones of the resulting number? We have done this in the last lecture by having a mask and keep sliding the resulting value, which is Z. This piece of code is exactly as we had in the lecture example, but it's Z instead of X, right? You simply have a mask you have your number that you want to know how many ones you have, you keep sliding and you count, right? Here you have a counter. So this is also what is, what is different from the lecture example. So the steps are the following. I do the XOR to give only the bit differences. So if I take the example in the last slide here, I had this. If I do XOR these two numbers, this will give me zero, one, one, zero, zero, one, one, zero. Why that's the case? Because every two bits that are the same gives you zero. Every two bits that are different gives you one. So I have done the first step, which is only identifying the bits that are different. Now it remains to count them. How to count them? Again, I would have a loop over all the lengths of the result, which is Z here. Go one by one and determine whether a bit or is one or not. How to determine whether a bit is one or not? I'm using the trick from the lecture where you mask with uh, 
a mask variable that has one only in this bit location and compare. If it gives you one, then I'm, I'm increasing the count. Otherwise, I'm, I'm not increasing the count, right? So this, is, this would be the idea of the solution. The solution will be posted and think about it. And if you got questions, we can discuss during office hours. Um, by this, we are done. But I would, again, remain for a few minutes to take questions if, if there are any. Okay, is there any question? Will you post last lecture today? Yes, yeah, now I, I should, I guess last lecture, this tutorial and today's lecture should be posted by today or, or in worst case, tomorrow morning. It's the shift, Karina, right? So it's, yeah, good. So this is equivalent to Z equal Z shifted to the right by one. But we are doing the shift and the assignment in one slide, similar to say z plus equal one, which is z equal z plus one, right? So it's the same thing, yeah. Should I still until questions are done to discuss? I guess we would be done um, soon, Mark, and, and maybe we can, um, can discuss afterwards. Can I discuss the midterm with you right now? I'm an overseas student, I cannot stay up that late to go to your office hours next Tuesday. So Frank, so the office hours are not, are not, I mean, it's during, it's directly after the lecture. So it's 1.30. I would say send me an email, okay? Send me an email. Uh, right now it's very hard because I have a lecture afterwards and uh, there is another, I would say different problem that I'm discussing with another student. So send me an email and we can see, right? Sorry, can I ask a question? Sure. Go ahead. Um, so for the symmetric example uh, with one, five, four, three, one. Um, so after you compare five and three, and then you return zero, what happened to the four? What would happen to? The four, like in the middle. Like what is the next step? Ah, uh, yeah, okay, the, you mean to recursion because we don't have a for loop, I see. I meant you, you meant recursion. What happens to the other functions, right? Good. Mm -hmm. Once you return zero, so the way to think about this is where a function really returns. Each time we return from the function, we come here, correct? Yes. So if you return zero, then this is similar to this line is replaced by return zero, correct? Mm -hmm. Which means you just close your, I mean, you just return zero. You are done, right? Yeah, and, and then the, the function that called this iteration, which is in this case would be the first iteration only, will also return zero because it, you, you encounter a line that has returned zero, right? So it will keep returning zero in all recurs recursive calls until you reach the first one that you called it and it returns zero, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, to visualize it to you, in this example, we had only two calls, but generally you would have, let's say I have as many calls as, as the array size until I hit the place where they don't match, right? This mm -hmm. one is going to return zero. So once I return, I remove it from the stack and pass the return to the one that called it. Here, it, this one would hit zero as well. So it, this one also will return zero, remove it from the stack, return zero from the stack until you hit the first one and the first one is going to return zero. So the zero will propagate to the very beginning. The reason that this is happening is simply because we want, once you break the condition of symmetry, you are done. You only need this zero, right? Oh, okay, I see. Right? Yeah. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Welcome. Uh, do we, so my question about the midterm wasn't that I want to get rid of it. I just think I solved it in a different way. So I would like to see where I went wrong. Is there any way to do this without regraining? So, so, so Okay, that's, that's, that's a good, so, uh, so the problem is the following, Katie, is you might have solved it in a different way that maybe, for example, the TA didn't catch it while we really had the rule that if there is a different solution, you have to, 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 to trace or track yourself. Uh, but it might be correct. So you might deserve certain, so I would say, okay, if you want this, this we can discuss what you have solved it and we, we look into it together. And if you might think it's still correct, we can look into the regrading. Yeah, we can do this. 
So, so yeah, I'm not expecting you to get the problem solved exactly the same way. There are so many, so this is programming, right? And there was a general rule that any different solution might be correct and we have to, tra to trace that. So you are not marked against the correct answer only, right? I, I only posted this for guidance for you, right? So um, if you want to discuss your solution with me, we can do this. Uh, if you want to discuss only the algorithm in high level without looking into your specific answer and don't regrade, I can also do that. Matusha, if I email you about midterm day of the midterm days and still have no reply, what should I do? Um, I, I know I'm late in some emails. Uh, some emails I have answered already through through uh, Avenue announcement because I thought the questions asked are more of a general question that everyone should know the answer for. So I, I would ask you to check my announcements if your question get answered. If not, then uh, I would say, uh, if you can please just reply to the email you send me just to put it in, my, in, in the top of my list of emails, I, I would appreciate this. Otherwise, I know I have already three or four emails at least in my list to look at, uh, but I wanted to, to wait until I post the midterm grades. So if you didn't receive an answer, you should receive from me by, by today or tomorrow, but just as a safeguard, reply to this email or to have it on, on top of my list, yeah. Okay, thanks everyone. I guess we, we, we are done by, by today and hopefully I would see you all in, um, in, in, in less than an hour. Uh, Mark, uh, what we can do is we can join uh, my, or even we can stay here. So what I can do is I will close this meeting and reopen it. Okay. Uh, and yeah, we can use it. Okay, good. Sounds good. Yeah, thanks. Can I ask the question? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Yeah, I'm just wondering for the thing you just talked about, uh, about the midterm, if I have a question like I think I'm doing right, how do I tell you? Should I send you an email or come to no, your what, office what, hours? So, Yan Hao, please check my, my announcement. So, the rule is please come to the office hours on Tuesday after the lecture where we okay. can look into the, yeah, look I see. answer correct. Yeah, yeah read, read, read this announcement, yeah, okay. Thanks everyone and, and talk to you later then, bye-bye.